Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Connect Group Bible Study where we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 6. It's Pentecost Sunday today and often we think of Pentecost in terms of how we've experienced the Holy Spirit or what the Holy Spirit is doing on the earth and in the church today. Um, But as well as thinking about Pentecost from the earth's perspective, we also can think about it from heaven's perspective. And in Revelation chapter 6, we see what's going on in heaven as the Holy Spirit is poured out onto the church in those first days, but also every day in this new age. And uh, even today, the Holy Spirit wants to be poured out into our lives and onto the church today. And so what we're going to see in this passage is the way that the Holy Spirit works uh, in uh, in God's church. Now, the book of Revelation can seem quite foreign. It's given to us not so much to answer all our questions, but it's given to us to t- cause us to think, to worship, and most importantly, to pray. And the most important thing about the book of Revelation is that it's the revelation of Jesus. This is all about Jesus. It's not necessarily about scary things or or um, things that should cause us fear, although some of the things are scary and are fearful, but ultimately it's to cause us to worship Jesus. So I'd love you to read this as always, Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 to 11, and uh, get somebody to read it out aloud. Have it out in front of you. Note down your questions. Note down anything that draws your attention and uh, anything that you can put into action. And just embrace it. This is, a, as I said, this is, can feel like a foreign text, but embrace it. Uh, read it prayerfully, and then we're going to have a look at it together and ask ourselves some questions. Okay, so a bit of background on Revelation chapter 6. The book of Revelation is written by John, who is one of Jesus' best friends. And towards the end of his life, while he's in exile on the island of Patmos, he has a vision of Jesus. Now, in one part of this vision that comes about from chapters 4 to 6, he is taken up to heaven and he sees what is going on in heaven. And what he sees is a, a eternal worship service. And he sees all these amazing things, these heavenly creatures worshipping God around a throne. There's these elders that lay their crowns down before God and they're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's precious stones. There's a sea of glass. There's lightning and thunder and a rainbow encircling all of it. It's basically like what we do at Kingdom Come, only with higher production values. Um, But the thing is, something is missing. And what we see in chapters four and five is that uh, where next to the throne there's supposed to be a prince there's just a closed book. And this is the book of life and nobody can open it. And so John starts to cry. Uh, He starts to weep. And then one of the elders kind of says, nudges John, says, cheer up. Look, here comes the lion. And John looks for a lion and instead he sees a lamb. And he sees a lamb that is slain. And that lamb is able to open the book of life because this is Jesus. And in giving up his life, in in allowing himself to be slain, he gets to give us life. That's the imagery that's going on here. So really you have... um, Jesus, uh, the lamb who's not there, and then he is there. This is the ascension where Jesus takes his rightful place in heaven. And then as he opens up the book of life, out come these four horses with riders on them. And one of the ways the church has understood this is this is the church being sent forth at Pentecost, being ridden by the Holy Spirit. It's a great image, isn't it? That the church is God's horse, ridden by the Holy Spirit, spurred on to do what we're supposed to do, guided uh, by the Holy Spirit. And we see four ways uh, that the Holy Spirit works through his church. And it's four ways that we can turn into prayers for our lives and for uh, the church and for the world around. So let's read together. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures in a voice like thunder say, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and it was given a crown and he rode out to conquer, bent on conquest. So the first horse is a white horse and it goes out to conquer. Now, the important thing here is as the church goes out, it goes out with a vision of Jesus's victory. Everything we do starts out of Jesus's victory on the cross. We're not trying to earn the victory. We're trying to outplay the victory. Here we have a horse and its rider is wearing a crown. Therefore, it's the king's horse. And the victory is not only for now, 
It's a promise for the future. We see that with this word bow. The rider holds a bow. And here, the word bow there in the Hebrew and then followed into the Greek is a play on words. You don't know if it's a war bow or if it's a rainbow, alluding to the Noah's story. Uh, In other words, it's both. This is a victory. This is a conquest. But it's a promise. It's a promise that God has done it and God will do it and God will complete everything that needs to be done. So our first prayer is this. As the church goes out, guided by the Spirit, Jesus, give us a vision for victory. Give us a vision for victory. And as we live our lives, cause others to see that vision of victory for themselves. And ultimately, that's Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. That's one of the main things the church goes out to do. Then John sees a second horse, says this, Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. This is like this pretty cool horse. And the rider was given power to take peace from the earth to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. And this key verse is here. He was given to take peace. And really, we we kind of surprised by this because we think, oh, no, the Holy Spirit comes to make us feel warm and make us feel fuzzy. But really, one of the things the Holy Spirit does is he takes away our peace. Now, he doesn't take away real peace. He takes away the peace that we've made when we've settled for kind of peace that is not peace. Jesus says, woe to those who say peace, peace, when there is no peace. This is where we've made peace with injustice, when we've made peace with oppression, when we've made peace with a vision for our lives that is less than your kingdom come. The Holy Spirit comes to shake us up. He makes us long for more. We're we're suddenly no longer happy with the way things are. Ah, there's like an internal war. So we're suddenly like, I don't want to settle for less. I want more. He takes away our peace and strife comes up. But it's good because it's a strife that leads to victory. It's a strife that leads to everything that God has for us. So our second prayer really is Holy Spirit, shake us up. Holy Spirit, shake us up. Don't let let us settle for less. Now here I'd love you to pause and ask a question. Where do you want to see the Holy Spirit shake things up? Maybe it's in your life. You Maybe you feel like you're coasting and you're like, oh, I know the Spirit wants to shake things up. Maybe I need to, to, to get deeper into the scriptures. Maybe I need to pray more. Maybe I need to, uh, you, I don't know what it is, but the Spirit's put his finger on it. And it's not condemnation, but it's conviction that he wants to do a new thing in your life. Maybe it's in your workplace that there's a culture that puts people down, that doesn't release people, that just, curses people doesn't bless them and you want to see the holy spirit shake things up maybe it's in in your nation maybe it's in your family i don't know what it is but where do you want to see the holy spirit shake things up discuss that and uh, you don't need to pray because we're going to pray for it at the end but just share with one another where you'd like to see the holy spirit shake things up okay then there's two more horses and the next horse that john sees uh, he saw there before me was a black horse. Its rider was wearing a pa- uh, was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, the six pound of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Here in this vision, the food runs out. In other words, there's a famine. And what food remains, people can't afford because it takes a whole day's wages just to make a loaf of bread. But what we see is there's plenty of oil and wine. When the spirit shakes us and gets to work in our life, the things that used to satisfy us, the things that used to bring us kind of kind of entertain us and bring us kind of like a pastime to way to pass our days. Suddenly we no longer get fed by them. Those that live on bread alone start to go hungry. But the good news is the oil and wine have not been damaged. There's loads of oil and wine. And those are signs of uh, the wine is a sign of what God has done on the cross. And the oil is a sign of the Holy Spirit being poured out. In other words, as we start to get dissatisfied with what used to feed us, God satisfies our desires with good things. As it says in Psalm 103, he satisfies our desires with good things. He provides for those who are anointed with, by his spirit and carry his name through what Jesus has done in the Holy Spirit, through on the cross. And so really, um, our prayer is, Holy Spirit, give us a fresh feast. This is why we're meeting now. This is why we're looking at the scriptures, because we want a fresh feast. We want to feast on your word. We want to feast on your presence. We want to enjoy that food with one another. Holy Spirit, give us a fresh feast. 
So our second question is, have you experienced this, where what used to satisfy you no longer does? Really, this is a chance just to share a bit of your story of coming to faith or your journey of faith. Uh, but were there things in your life where that you used to do naturally and then as you got to know Jesus, as you followed him, slowly they uh, went away or maybe suddenly they went away? I know for me, one of the things was when I got filled with the spirit and really my faith became a daily thing, I suddenly had a longing. Uh, I specifically for my sister to experience the things that I'd experienced and our relationship suddenly we, we became friends in a way that we'd never done before that was in sort of my later teen years uh, for other people it may be it was an addiction that was broken or, or or anywhere in those sort of two extremes but where have you seen the Holy Spirit change your appetites change your desires and where things used to satisfy you they no longer did and then he's filled it with something else as it says in Psalm 103 he satisfies our desires with good things. Just share a few of those. I'm sure it'll be a real encouragement to hear that. The next thing the church does is the last of the horses. And it's slightly surprising. John probably wasn't expecting this. We're probably not expecting this. I look and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword and famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now, this surprises us, but it probably shouldn't, us, but it shouldn't surprise us because without a death, you can't have a resurrection. You have to die before you are going to be raised again. And one of the, thing, the sp things that the Spirit does is the Spirit comes and by the law, he puts us to death. He convicts us of our sin. He shows us that we are unable to save ourselves. And then as we die to ourselves, as we say, Jesus, I can't do it. He then raises us to new life. Now, also, something we have to wrestle with here is that God is holy. God is powerful. And this is a New Testament text. So the people reading this would have been thinking Ananias and Sapphire. Like, Sapphire, don't mess around with the Holy Spirit. And another time you can, you can look at, at that. But when the Spirit comes as a judge, people die. But, but mostly he doesn't come as a judge. Or when he does come as a judge, it's to convict us of our sin so that we can be free from our sin and we can have new life. The Spirit puts us to death before bringing us back to life. Now, um, what I love about these uh, four uh, pictures, these four horses, is um, when I, I used to work designing websites, and we would talk about the user journey of um, user journey of using our website or our product. And really, here you kind of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The apocalypse simply means an opening, a revealing of who Jesus is. But really, this is kind of the user journey of people coming to faith. You come to faith when you when you see the white horse and you see a vision of what Jesus has done on the cross. Then when you encounter the red horse, as, as Jesus removes our peace and we're suddenly like, ah, oh, what used to satisfy me no longer does. When we encounter the black horse, when there's famine, it used to feed us. And now we're like, no, it doesn't feed us. I need something more. And then when we ultimately encounter the pale horse and by the spirit, we are put to death in order that we can be raised to new life. Now, we're uh, just gearing up for the leadership conference over the next two days. But, but this happens all the time, that the Holy Spirit puts his finger on certain things and says, uh, if you want to grow, this has to go. If you want to grow, this has to go. And the Holy Spirit will put his finger on things that we need to let die in our own lives and in our churches and in our, our cultures and in our workplaces so that he can bring new life to us. And so our fourth prayer is, Jesus, we want nothing less than resurrection life, resurrection life. And just as Jesus died, we want to die with him so that we might be raised again. Now, just before we uh, pray for one another, uh, this just this last bit that's interesting for us to think about as leaders. Um, Jesus, uh, 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 John says this as he sees this vision of Jesus. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who've been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Now, the key thing here is the altar. This is a place of sacrifice. And what we see is this word testimony is this here, martyrian, which is where we get the word martyr. Now, the key thing here is, yes, a martyr might be somebody who is killed for their faith, who, who uh, as they witness for Jesus, people don't like it. But, it. but really, it's anyone who loses their life in any way 
for the testimony of Jesus. And that's all of us in some way or another, from the small thing of giving up your time to pray, to be here tonight, to serve one another, through to uh, the extremes where people get kicked out of families, they lose inheritance and sometimes get physically attacked. Um, We are all martyrs as we lay our lives down for Jesus, as we lay our life on his altar. Now, the great thing is the prayer that they're praying is, how long, sovereign Lord, how long until you avenge us? In other words, they're asking for justice and they're told not yet. They were told, wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, the brothers and sisters were killed just as they have been. In other words, Jesus says, we need more martyrs. We need more leaders who are willing to lay down their life for the love of God, lay down their lives in the love of their neighbor and serve their neighbors. That's what a leader is, somebody who who lays down their life, leading and loving those around them. Now, Jesus is our great high priest because he's both priest and sacrifice. He mediates his own sacrifice and we are too. We're supposed to learn how to sacrifice our lives better in the service of others. That's why competency matters, because the law shows that a sacrifice was supposed to be uh, given in a certain way. And that's what the leadership conference is about, really. So I know this will be slightly retrospective, but pray for all those who came to the leadership conference and learn things. Pray that they would know how to lay their lives down better as they love others and as they lead others and pray it for ourselves. So Here really is the prayer. I want you to pray. Pray, Holy Spirit, come. Give us a vision of victory. Shake us up. Give us a fresh feast on your word and raise us up to new life. Pray that for each other. Lay hands on each other. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and move. This is Pentecost season where we remember again that God wants to pour out his spirit on all of us in remarkable ways and do things that we kind of never expected him to do, but he's been longing to do all along. Have a great night praying for each other and see you on Sunday.